to launch our meeting today, we're going to begin with our HESBE board chair, Amy Frost. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, as said before, my name is Amy Frost. I'm a high school history teacher. Uh, I've been doing that work for about 20 years now. I also have the opportunity to serve as the Professional Educator Standards Board board chair, and I'm honored to have the opportunity to welcome you to learn about teacher residency programs in Washington State. Thanks for joining us. At PESB, our mission, vision, and strategic direction focuses on our work on serving all Washingtonians by advancing policies that support educators, students, and families served least well by the education system. Emerging conversations about teacher residency in Washington State provide an exciting opportunity for collaborative conversations regarding equity in educator preparation. We are so fortunate to have Dr. Linda Darling Hammond provide remarks about teacher residencies and how they might bring about educational justice. Then we will hear from two panels, national experts and Washington State leaders who can deepen our understanding of teacher residency and what they might look like in our state. To begin, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond is the Charles E. Ducoman Pro Professor of Education Emeritus at Stanford University and founding president of the Learning Policy Institute, created to provide high quality research for policies that enable equitable and empowering education for each and every child. She is a past president of the American Educational Research Association and author of more than 30 books and 600 other publications on ed educational equality and equity, including the award-winning book, The Flat World and Education, How America's Commitment to Equity Will Determine Our Future. In two 2006, she was named one of the nation's 10 most influential people affecting educational policy. She led the Obama Education Policy Transition Team in 20, 2008 and the Biden Education Transition Team in 2020. She was appointed president of the California State Board of Education in 2019. In 2022, Darling Hammond received the uh, Yadon Prize for Education Research in recognition of her work that has shaped education policy and practice around the most equitable and effective ways to teach and learn. Thank you, Dr. Darling Hammond. It's an honor to have you here, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you. I am really pleased to be here. And uh, just as you were finishing that wonderful introduction, I realized that my computer's running out of battery juice. So I have just moved to another room and I am plugging in my computer. <laughs> so we are ready to go. I'm really honored to be asked to do this. This is a topic about which I am passionate. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited about what's going on in Washington State around residencies. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, here we go. And there we go. Uh, I'm going to talk a little about sort of where residencies has been as a concept, what's going on across the country. I will tell you that in um, 2007, I was working with then Senator Obama, uh, helping draft the federal residency legislation that went into um, ultimately the Teacher Quality Partnership Program. Uh, and uh, that came about because there was a very successful program in Chicago where uh, President Obama uh, was coming from, where uh, they had really begun in Chicago to do this approach to recruiting teachers uh, in training them in collaboration with uh, universities in the district, paying them on the way to becoming teachers, uh, and then finding uh, very um, strong outcomes, uh, both in the preparation that people received and their ability and willingness to stay in the profession. So it's uh, a, a solution to a lot of problems. I'm going to talk today about the power of residencies for student and school success uh, and put it in that framework and what's going on now in the States. Unfortunately, what's happening is I'm gonna have to stop sharing my screen for a minute because it's not advancing the slides. So I'm gonna share it again. I've had this experience before where sometimes you have to come in and reboot. This reminds me of Zoom teaching. How many of you did Zoom teaching <laughs> during the pandemic? We all learned We all learned how to do it. I was teaching teachers uh, then and I, my, I learned from, them a lot about how to manage the technologies. 
So one of the first things is that we start from the presumption that well-prepared teachers matter greatly. That has not always been a given in this country. People don't always acknowledge uh, how much uh, the preparation of teachers matters for student success. But we have a large body of research that finds that student learning is related to teachers' uh, qualifications, academic background, preparation prior to entry, the quality of that, the certification in their field that they're teaching, their level of experience. Uh, and national board certification is another indicator. Uh, one study found uh, across North Carolina that in combination, these factors predicted more of the difference in student learning gains than race and parent education combined. So it really matters, but well-prepared teachers are not equitably distributed in most parts of the country. Uh, and so it's a key policy area to really address the issues of equity that are in front and center for all of us. What do we mean by a teacher residency? Here are a couple of resources to guide the way that we may think about um, that definition. Uh, we did a study at LPI uh, back in 2016 about teacher residencies across different um, uh, places, uh, districts where they were being launched and what the track record was. And then there's been a recent Pathways Alliance publication called Towards a National Definition of Teacher Residencies, as these are coming about in many states. And I encourage you to um, look at uh, both of those. Um, in general, the uh, characteristics of teacher residencies have to do with uh, the partnership that uh, exists between districts. It may be a consortium of districts or a single district uh, with educator preparation program or programs. Uh, and also other players are often in the mix, uh, teachers associations, uh, community-based organizations, and others uh, may also be in the mix. But the goal is to prepare teachers in a way that is both uh, the highest quality of uh, coursework and, and matched to high-quality clinical work, a full year uh, of training under the wing of expert teachers, uh, in a district or districts where they are anticipated to be hired. And they're actually learning the curriculum and the strategies, the approaches that that district or districts uh, really want to be sure teachers learn. So it's a, it's a true partnership so that uh, we bring together uh, the, uh, the educators who are already working uh, and expert and the teacher education uh, preparation providers. Uh, usually the cohort is selected by both of those players, by all the partners, because they're being selected not just to come into the preparation program, but into the uh, eventual hiring. Uh, there's a teaching commitment, usually of three to five years, uh, because the dollars that are being spent are intended to cover both um, the tuition and uh, some kind of a stipend or salary. And of course, the degree to which that can be uh, a reasonable stipend or salary uh, is the degree to which you can really recruit and retain uh, people into the preparation process and then into the profession. Uh, that full year of residency with uh, one or more expert teachers um, is usually about 900 hours of clinical experiences, uh, which is um, you know, uh, quite a bit more than many beginning teachers otherwise we'll have the opportunity to get. The coursework is tightly integrated with the um, clinical work so that as you're studying you know, um, methods of teaching, you're applying them in the classroom and they are often, the professors are often in the schools, the professional development schools that are part of the residency. It may be that the uh, expert teachers in that school are also co-teaching or teaching some of the courses. So there's really a, an integrated approach so teachers aren't trying to figure out, well, how am I supposed to apply this over here? Or how does this course over here relate to that other one over there? It is really designed to be a coherent experience. Uh, it uh, can lead to a, a credential uh, or often a master's degree. Uh, this originated as a post-baccalaureate strategy to recruit people uh, who may be coming a second career, maybe coming back from the military, maybe uh, coming from a university bachelor's degree program uh, into teaching. There are now some models that are beginning to take root at the undergraduate level as well. Uh, and that's something that uh, is worth um, knowing about. Uh, 
the uh, process of the uh, residency also involves early career mentoring. So that's actually part of the package. And in the original residency programs, uh, two years of early career induction and mentoring were built into the planning, the resources, uh, et cetera. So it's a smooth entry into the profession uh, that is well-supported, uh, coherent, uh, and what we've been finding in the research is that it tends to lead to improved teaching and learning uh, and stronger preparation. Uh, and as I'm gonna say in a moment, higher retention rates. How are states investing in residencies? Well, there are now uh, 10 states at least that have made state investments in residencies. Uh, Washington, as you know, Montana, New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, West Virginia, Mississippi, Texas, New Mexico, and California. California has made the largest investments, although I will say Texas is also uh, making a substantial uh, investment right now that uh, is expected to continue in some form or another uh, beyond their ESSER funding. Uh, and so uh, what we're seeing is that uh, more and more uh, states are understanding that if you really want to solve teacher shortages in the right way, rather than hiring underprepared teachers, which is what often happens. We have in the United States more than 300,000 classrooms right now filled either with underprepared teachers or um, that are uh, officially vacant and may just have a substitute teacher. Uh, and when that happens, uh, those teachers tend to come in and out rather quickly. We have a, uh, a degree of churn. We know that that undermines student achievement. Uh, something we really have to worry about now in this post-pandemic era where we're trying to uh, help children catch up uh, from uh, what was going on before the pandemic. Uh, and so it doesn't solve the shortage, it actually exacerbates it when we try to address it in that way. This is really a strategy to uh, address shortages in a way that will be a long-term fix uh, for um, the uh, challenges of Re recruiting and retaining teachers. Retaining teachers is extremely important. Nine out of 10 positions each year uh, need to be filled because of someone who left. And only a third of the people who leave are leaving for retirement. Two thirds are leaving because the profession is not meeting their needs because they're dissatisfied uh, with one or another aspect of it. You probably know that teachers typically are about paid about 20% less than their peers in other occupations, even adjusting for the different calendar year. Uh, and so there's, you know, uh, you, you need to have uh, a strategy to bring people in. And the better prepared people are, the longer they stay because they feel more competence, they're getting more satisfaction from teaching because they are more effective uh, and it is uh, possible for them to really uh, derive the kinds of uh, internal benefits uh, as well as hopefully external benefits. But those external uh, factors cannot include a lot of debt if we're going to keep people in the profession. So this is from California. We just did a big study in the last year uh, using the uh, completer surveys from that people have to fill out as they're going for their credential and to finish their program. So it's a very high response rate. And among the respondents, about 10% uh, in uh, 2020, 2021 identified as residents. Uh, and of these, 60% identified as teachers of color. And uh, we have a fairly diverse teaching force in California. In any event, about between 30 and 40% of our current teachers are teachers of color. Uh, but uh, residencies uh, attracted uh people of color at even higher rates uh, than student teaching programs and other pathways. Uh, we've found both in California and nationally that residents are viewed as highly effective. Uh, the residents themselves view their programs as highly effective uh, and more than 90% of them, 100% um, rated them as uh, at least adequate, but more than 90% rated them as effective or highly effective. Uh, and then they uh, support strong clinical learning. We found two thirds of residents had more than the 600 hours in the classroom of cooperating teachers uh, that are expected in California. Uh, and um, there were a good third of them that had 800 hours or more. So it's really, they start at the beginning of the year with the children. Uh, they're uh, probably beginning with the professional development that the district offers. They're in the classroom the whole year. 
uh, usually at least three or four days of the week or five days a week, you know, at least four or five hours a day. Uh, they get to know the students. They get to know the uh, practices in the school. If the school is using things like restorative practices or if they're um, engaged in certain kinds of school improvement activities, uh, the residents are right there uh, learning and experiencing and participating and contributing to all of those things. Uh, the California residents report high levels of clinical support. Uh, that is the amount of feedback that they got, the amount of observations and so on. So uh, uh, over 50% uh, felt that they were getting a very high levels of support, uh, which is uh, even more than student teachers who got more support than interns uh, or others who were coming in through different pathways. Uh, the national studies that we've reviewed show strong ratings and learning gains for graduates of residencies in multiple states and cities. California studies have found residents highly rated by principals, both during and after their residencies. They also have very high retention rates, which, as I said, is critically important for solving shortages and also allowing teachers to become more effective because teachers are more effective after their first year, few years in the classroom. But if they don't last that long, we never get the benefit of their learning process. Uh, we find typically uh, retention rates for residency graduates uh, typically above 85 uh, percent. In California, we found that um, 91% had completed their programs and were hired into full-time teaching positions and 88% were still teaching generally in those same districts two years after graduating. And these are typically high need districts uh, and they are often in high need schools. Uh, and this is just a summary of some of the studies that have gone on. And you can see that depending on the place, uh, the differential in retention rates between residents and other hires in the districts is anywhere between 10% and 50%, uh, as in Memphis. So uh, big differentials in most places. Uh, the other piece of the puzzle that is really important is that residencies disrupt the anatomy of inequality. Uh, the uh, way in which inequality occurs in the United States begins with poverty and segregation, which have become more and more connected to one another. Uh, we have more and more students who are low income in public schools, and we have more and more schools that are uh, serve concentrations of poor students uh, and students of color. Uh, that is often then um, a part of the way resources are distributed, and we've had unequal school resources in most states. Those resources are unequal in that the more affluent districts get more resources than those that serve the neediest students. Uh, that uh, supports inadequate preparation of educators and unequal distribution of educators because salaries are different from place to place. And so the capacity of districts to recruit and retain teachers is very different. That supports unequal access to curriculum in often dysfunctional schools. And uh, if you think about what that means for the education of children, when uh, a lot of teachers have an inadequate understanding of learning, development, and pedagogy, it often leads to poorly organized instruction. It's associated with exclusionary disciplines, suspensions, and expulsions, uh, the inability to teach heterogeneous classes, which reinforces tracking. And if you add to that the effects of um, implicit bias, which uh, are widespread, uh, it's not coming up on my screen for some reason, um, that then compounds the effects, especially on students of color and students with disabilities. Uh, and so when you disrupt that, when you bring in teachers in high need communities and high need schools who are, who are taught by the best teachers in those communities, uh, they learn to, um, uh, appreciate the students, to understand the students, the community, the families, and then they come on into the teaching force, uh, you really see a very different quality of teaching. There it is. <laughs> the fact that uh, we can uh, undo some of the both implicit bias and the inadequate preparation. I want to make the point, too, that residencies could leverage a new kind of teaching. You know, we've got a lot of conversation in this post-pandemic era about how schools need to be transformed. We have uh, declining enrollment in many places, disenrollment. We have chronic absenteeism. We have schools uh, that are designed uh, uh, for the uh, 100 years ago, the factory model, that are not ready to be responsive to the students we have today. 
Uh, and there's a recognition across the country that we've got to be moving from the old sit and get form of instruction where each student is working on their own, often getting ready to answer multiple choice questions on uh, the test to a mode of instruction, which we know can be more effective uh, in which students are collaborating on inquiries that are meaningful, uh, where they're learning more deeply, where the teachers are supporting that uh, and where schools are designed to enable. Uh, the kind of learning that is being demanded in the economy. We've had a growth in the uh, demand for complex skills and thinking, a big dec decrease in the demand for routine skills. In fact, we now have, you know, uh, vehicles on the streets that are, you know, even driverless, uh, but so many things are being automated. Uh, and those things that are easiest to digitize and automate and outsource uh, also happen to be the kinds of things that are the easiest to teach and test. And so we've got a shift from the mentality that we had about what teaching and schooling are in the uh, in the industrial age to the kind of learning that we now need. Knowledge is growing at a rapid clip. There was more new knowledge created in the world between 1999 and 2003 than in the history of the world preceding. Uh, that means that uh, we can't just have kids, you know, memorize things, you know, in 12 bytes of the curriculum in each grade level uh, and be baked and done because they're going to be working with knowledge that hasn't been discovered yet, with technologies that haven't been invented yet, solving major problems that we haven't managed to solve. And one manifestation of this demand uh, is apparent at Google, which is right up the street from me in Silicon Valley, where uh, they... Uh, did huge studies and collected the transcripts and all of the grades and test scores and everything of their uh, employees and did a big study about what predicted success at Google. And they found out that none of those indicators predicted success at Google. In fact, uh, what they decided was actually predictive of success was what they called learning ability. The ability to take a, a problem or a task, work with others to figure out strategies, collect information, uh, analyze it, synthesize it, put it together, develop a solution, test it, refine it, revise it uh, in, in the way that we now need schools to be preparing students to transfer and apply knowledge, to communicate and collaborate, to find and use those resources, uh, to self-manage and be able to improve on one's own, to be able to learn to learn. And um, that is part of the challenge for teacher education and for districts. Uh, we have a chicken and an egg problem. Do you prepare teachers for the schools as they have been, or do you prepare them for the schools as we want them to become? Uh, but what the implications are for uh, teaching is that effective teachers have to be able to teach more sophisticated thinking and performance skills. They have to be able to teach all of those skills to more diverse students with a greater range of needs while redesigning schools to meet these 21st century demands. Uh, and this requires a, a new set of knowledge, skills, and dispositions. We published something recently on what the science of learning and development suggests for educator preparation programs. And uh, in addition to traditional knowledge of learners and learning, child development and learning processes, and knowledge of subject matter and curriculum, uh, and we have a deep set of um, uh, requirements for knowing uh, how to teach diverse learners, how to assess them in ways that are in fact educative, uh, how to uh, develop adaptive expertise, uh, to uh, be engaged in curriculum design, that, to engage in their own inquiries, to continue to improve their practice, uh, to have a sense of efficacy uh, because of those abilities, uh, cultural competence, a commitment to equity, social emotional capacity as well, which we've learned matters so much during the pandemic. And it also requires a powerful approach uh, to teacher learning. Uh, what it turns out is that everything students need for their learning, teachers need too. They need hands-on experiences. They need uh, the opportunity for modeling and mentoring and getting feedback. Uh, they need to learn in a community of practice. Uh, and that means that uh, we can use this uh, kind of um, moment uh, to reinvent schools that provide places for people to learn to teach that have those qualities. Uh, so. 
in a sense, one can use, as some of the districts in California and some in New York and elsewhere are doing, can use these residencies and opportunities for reinventing the schools uh, by making the placement sites for residents be the sort of demonstration schools, if you will, that are already beginning to exemplify these features of a new form of schooling. Uh, we do need to reinvent schools to achieve the goals that we now have because the schools that were designed in the early 1900s were based on the factory model, uh, which was standardized. It was put the kids on an assembly line. They move along from one grade to the other to be stamped with the curriculum from one class to another uh, without very many opportunities for deep relationships, especially in secondary schools uh, for a whole child approach. We weren't designed for that for these kinds of 21st century skills and the personalized supports that students need. Uh, and it does not produce equitable opportunity or achievement. And that was actually in the design of the factory model. The factory model in the early 1900s was really designed uh, in partnership with eugenicists who invented IQ tests and tracking systems that were um, intended to keep uh, students on different trajectories. So uh, reinventing school means focusing on uh, authentic learning and equity and harnessing the knowledge of human development, learning and effective teaching that we've been accumulating and that we need. Uh, and that science uh, tells us that many of the things that we designed our current system around are not true. Uh, it is not true that genes drive whom we become. You can't tell what a student's or child's intelligence is you know, when they're born that in fact context is the primary driver of whom we become. And the more we provide rich uh, learning experiences and strong relationships, the more people learn. Uh, we thought that talent was scarce so we had to identify a small percentage of students, gifted and talented or advanced students who would get a different kind of education uh, and others would just be prepared for the factories and the farms. Uh, we now know that talent is plentiful and it's not on a bell curve. Uh, we thought average it stood for the individual, so we taught people to teach for the average, but it turns out that no two brains are alike, and average almost never represents an individual. Uh, we really have to understand the variation and teach to the variation. Uh, we thought that we could standardize uh, along the factory model assembly line to educate children uh, and sort of hand them, you know, uh, the pieces of information they need. We now know that agency and engagement are what support motivation and learning. Uh, we thought that potential was knowable in advance, but we now know the potential is visible in the environments that are designed to reveal it. So these principles for uh, from the science of learning and development for whole school design are those that ought to guide the places in residencies where we train uh, teachers. Positive developmental relationships really set up for those that's a whole nother conversation how to do it, but many schools are uh, redesigning themselves to provide more time and relational capacity, um, environments that are filled with safety and belonging, uh, rich inquiry-oriented learning experiences, experiential learning, uh, development of social emotional skills and habits and mindsets very explicitly, and then integrated supports for healthcare, uh, social supports, et cetera, so that every child's needs get met when they need to be met. So as in medicine, uh, which has uh, teaching hospitals, uh, the use of residencies to strengthen and create these professional teaching schools uh, could help us instantiate deeper learning and equity and bring more people into the profession who already feel comfortable uh, teaching in this way. Uh, it could allow teachers to see and enact the best practices and as in teaching hospitals, uh, create a community of practice, uh, unite theory and practice, uh, and then uh, allow us to develop new designs and practices at research. I'm gonna close by just saying that uh, residencies have provided opportunity uh, in a number of ways to reach some of the key goals uh, for teacher education and for teaching generally. Uh, one goal uh, would uh, unseat that old statement that those who can do and those who can't do, uh, teach and really transform it to those who can do and those who understand teach. Uh, and uh, on top of that, 
that those who can teach because it's a desirable profession with an accessible pathway and those who can't go into a less significant line of work. Thank you. Uh, I hope you see the reactions coming in, uh, Dr. Darlington, and for mm -hmm. uh, for this um, tutorial, this talk, this background knowledge building, and helping us think deeply about um, how to enter this work responsibly, and all of the um, the possible benefits are exciting. So. Uh, thank you. You can see from um, from the responses from the group that they highly valued what you provided for us. And um, so just know when you go to bed at night that you've made a large number of Washingtonians happy <laughs> and better off with having shared what you've done. So um, thank you. And we will uh, graciously allow you to move on to your next um next appointment so and we thank will you. move on and extend the discussion and good luck to you thank you <laughs> so much and thank you all out there who are um uh, giving us emojis and asking questions we will do our best to answer them uh along the way, but also know that it is our intention to have uh, some follow-up like public forums to speak more freely because uh, our panelists are here um, and Dr. Darling Hammond is here to really provide information to build background knowledge. And then we will begin discussing like, well, what does that mean and how might this work? So um, we will carry on I want to introduce you to our group of national panelists. We have Karen DeMoss from Prepared to Teach. She's done work all around the nation to help states uh, bring about residency programs. Uh, I know she has a specific interest in how to get them funded in sustainable ways. We have Nick Gillen, a consultant from John Hopkins University. He was um, one of the leaders in the development of the residency, teacher residency report that went to the legislature last year. So he can speak to us from that experience. We have Dr. Etta Hollins. Uh, uh, she is the Pesby Scholar in Residence, um, Emeritus Faculty from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and has been a renowned leader in teacher preparation around the country and internationally. Uh, and then we also have Rod Lucero. He is the founder, one of the founding members of the National Center for Clinical Practice and Educator Preparation, has done work nationally and internationally with um, uh, uh, AATCE and, and many other groups. So we're here for his expertise on clinical practice. We have my new friend, Blake West from the National Education Association. We um, keep running into each other at our national conferences around licensure. And finally, I am adding, uh, uh, introducing Dr. Ken Zeichner. He is emeritus faculty from the University of Washington, Seattle. Um, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So I don't know. Uh, I have never met a person who's had been emeritus faculty from two world-renowned institutions. We have all of this talent in one place to respond to some questions. And here are the questions that they will be answering today. Our team will po paste these questions in the chat. We'll help you if you're not able to turn your camera on. We'll get you squared away in just a second. Um, but here are the big questions that we would like our national panel to discuss. Uh, first, who are the essential partners in a residency program and what role should they, should they play? What factors should be included in teacher residencies to protect underserved students from academic learning loss and lost opportunities while 
learning for learning while residents are developing teaching competence. What benefits might be anticipated for P-12 students if they're in a classroom hosting a resident for a year? What are the academic and developmental benefits for those underserved students? Uh, let me see, move my little bar here. Um, what benefits might be anticipated in the classroom of an early career educator who completed a year long residency as a part of their preparation? And what level of compensation and other supports are needed if a year long residency is to be successful in recruiting and supporting diverse pools of candidates to program completion? So we will put those questions in the chat. Austin, I'm hoping you can um, paste those in the chat for me. And now I'm going to stop sharing so that you can see the faces of our panelists here. Where are you, Dr. Zeichner? I'm looking for your name so I can make it possible for you to turn your video on. So you should be able to do that now. And I am going to spotlight our, um, well, let's say I'm going to pin our national panelists so that you can see them all at the same time. So our very first question, I will, while I'm pinning you, who are the essential partners in a residency program and what role should they play? I'm actually going to toss that one to uh, Dr. Zeichner first, because I know that was uh, one that was of interest of him. And then the rest of y'all feel free to chime in after. Am I missing any more of my national folks? No, I am. All right. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, um, who are the essential partners in uh, teacher residencies? The um, latest literature on residencies uh, says that there are partnerships between school districts or LEAs and programs. Most of those are universities, but some of them are not programs. And that other entities could be involved. And uh, Linda gave a few examples of those uh, teacher unions and uh, and community based organizations. I strongly believe that the essential partners must include um, the program, the school district in, involved, um, the local teachers union or teacher association. I believe is a central partner, and um, some representation from the broader community, whether it's um, community-based organization or community leaders. Um, I was involved in the development of the uh, Seattle Teacher Residency. I think it's we started talking about that back in, I think, 2010 or so. It's It's been around for over a decade. Um, and um, we started out with just the district and the university. Um, ed school in negotiating it, but um, we really needed early on in the process to bring in the local Seattle's Education Association and a community partner, which in the case of that program is the Alliance for Education, to get that broader community involvement and bringing them in from the very beginning, not just having them react to things that the quote unquote experts at the um, universities and school districts develop. I think it's essential um, if we're concerned about equity that the broader community uh, be in there from the beginning and the teachers union, which uh, school university partnership does not ne necessarily represent teacher unions and the uh, uh, needs and uh, concerns of the uh, teachers in, in, in those schools. And that, uh, to me, is connected to a program that is locally uh, focused. There are examples of um, residency programs that, um, um, and some of these are implemented nationally, that have the same exact curriculum, no matter where it's implemented. 
I think one of the core concepts of a residency, pro residency program is how it's locally designed for the particular context um, that's involved. Um, and, and you can't have that without strong participation from the broader community, including uh, families, representatives of families whose kids were, were claiming to hope to benefit through this program. Um, and, and so I think that's the, the most important thing to me is this uh, uh, disruption of the typical um, power hierarchies that have existed in teacher education for many years. And I've been around doing this work for over 47 years now. Um, and I've seen a lot of uh, rhetoric about partnerships, but residencies, uh, some of them have uh, broken out of that pattern and really um, design something that's uh, where the, that are shared, shared responsibility for the success of the program. That's not typical in traditional teacher education. I'll stop there and let others jump in. You know, I, I and Ken, I absolutely agree with everything you just said. Um, the the other piece that I might add into the equation is the SEA and kind of flipping the table a bit, but including the SEA as a, it's not the expert, but the fact that we're informing them about what we're doing. Oftentimes in the SEA, they aren't the experts that, that are pedagogically, depending on what state you're in, they could be elected officials and those kinds of things, but inviting them in to learn more about what it is we're doing. The um, the other thing I would add and, and just reemphasize is the idea of, of um, Munich, the, the development of mutually beneficial partnerships that are truly co-constructed for the context in which they reside. Um, I'm a former vice president at um, AACTE, as Erica noted, and was lead off lead author of the Clinical Practice Commission report um, that we released in 2018. <clears throat> in that report, we um, we we listed a, a list of ten um, proclamations. One of those is the importance of context. And so what makes sense in um, San Francisco is, is not gonna make sense in uh, Vancouver, Washington. It, 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 it just can't. And so there becomes this, this flattening of the power dynamic when you sit around a table, pre-K-12 and higher ed, co-constructing what this partnership will look like, what are our contributions and what are our takeaways? And so that whole mutual beneficial mutually beneficial partnership piece is mutually negotiated as well. It flattens the power structure and it really sets the stage for success. So those are the things I would add. Thanks all. Karen DeMoss here. <laughs> I just want to say how excited I am to be here and yes to everything that's happened so far in terms of voice. Um, there is a, a sort of a follow on to this question of what are those roles I agree completely with all that's been said. And if we are, as a, a sector, looking to create those kinds of schools and that kind of new educational system that uh, Linda Darling Hammond shared with us as a potential that residencies can, can help us get to, we really do have to do that co-construction. And Rod, I'm going to one plus the concept of the states. The states are actually players. The states are the ones who own responsibility for the quality of education. It is a state responsibility to provide equitable and quality education across all the country. So having them in the mix can not only be helpful in terms of having them learn, but also they can provide some convening powers, some, some sort of conversation with legislators powers. That's what we're doing in New Mexico, where although the amount isn't as much, the per capita investment is higher than any other state in the nation in terms of the investment in teacher residencies, where the programs and the districts and there are community partners and the state is there, are in a community of practice to figure out what makes sense that can work across the state and what makes sense for folks to be able to do locally. So there's there's a state framework developing along with those local um, implementation pieces that must be um, nuanced for the contexts. I might join in. Yes. At, oh, go ahead, Dr. Hollins. <laughs> My name is Anna Hollins. I'm a professor emeritus at uh, the University of Missouri, Kansas City. 
And I agree with all that has been said. I, I do want to add another uh, player to the partnership, however, um, and this has to do with funding, okay? I think that every um, residency program should be partnered with a philanthropist. <laughs> So, you know, like I don't hear people saying that very often, but all of these cities have philanthropists and the philanthropists are very often looking for uh, ways to support local communities. And I think sometimes they could use a little bit of assistance in terms of ways to uh, su be supportive in communities. And so I would suggest that 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 is for the residencies that I know about an untapped resource. Um, the other thing that I would like to add to this discussion um, is that I think we need to kind of think about how people interact in a partnership and how they are provided a forum for sharing and learning within that partnership. I think we need to really give some thought to that. Um, and, and, and what I'm kind of thinking about is if I were to think about, you know, how um, communities benefit, I think that that would mean that we're actually talking about community values, community goals, um, and the challenges that might be faced in the community um, with the people who are residents of the community. So they are actually telling us about their needs, et cetera. So I think, you know, that um, kind of fits in with all the other things that I'm hearing people say about what we need to think about in relationship to uh, teacher residencies. And my name's Blake West. Uh, several years ago, I left my role as a classroom teacher and teacher leader in Kansas to join NEA staff where my focus has been on teacher preparation issues. And uh, I, I, as a union person, you've got to uh, imagine that uh, we would want to see unions as some of the partners. I just want to give a few of the reasons that I think are critical there. One of them is that uh, right now, for instance, NEA has uh, over 40,000 uh, aspiring educators, uh, people in programs around the country who are at a point of a groundswell of support for seeing pay for student teaching. And I think it's absolutely essential that uh, even though teach, uh, pay for student teaching is a great idea, we need to make sure that that's paired with the kind of quality that we see in residency programs so that they become it becomes a sustainable model. Uh, along with that, uh, Places like NEA, uh, we've been a, ph a philanthropist uh, in helping places such as the Seattle Teacher Residency get off the ground and other places across the country. So I do see that as one of the roles. The, the other area would be our role as advocate. And once teachers begin to see how uh, this uh, kind of preparation benefits students, benefits their school and the change of culture and the transformation of their schools, they become supportive of the district's financial investment in this for the long term. And we need that. We need districts to be part of the financial contributors to this. And we need the unions on board so that they're supportive of that. They're also a powerful uh, voice for advocacy for legislatures. And some of our best spokespersons for this would be those aspiring educators. And again, the union can help to organize and bring those voices into the legislature to say, this is so important for our development and our success, and also uh, for the diversification of the profession so that we have persons with an equal playing field with access into the profession. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Hi, all. Much appreciated. I, I'll just add a few comments that I haven't heard. Uh, my name is Nicholas Gillen. I work for Johns Hopkins University. In the past, I've worked for PESB. I've worked in teacher preparation and been a teacher. Uh, of late, I had an opportunity to convene a work group with many people who I saw in the participant group and many people I see in this panel group uh, to write some recommendations for the legislature on behalf of OSPI. I'll share those in the chat so that we can continue uh, that conversation going forward. I want to mention a couple of other partner uh, partner uh, constituents that that are probably on our minds. So 
uh, thinking about our tribal communities is something that's really important to me. And when we're in a situation where we're thinking about uh, reaching individuals who are furthest from educational opportunity, I want to make sure that that's on the table. Um, I'll plus one what I'm hearing about uh, mentors, for example, as a key partner. But let's also think about not just the who, but the how. So how do mentors and mentors in a like a full on residency system network, how do they learn from each other? Uh, in a residency system that works, think about BEST within Washington, our beginning educator supports team and that, that induction mentoring and how we need that to connect better with our pre-service mentoring. Uh, think about candidates and candidates. Cohort models work because candidates can learn and connect with each other. So think about, think about that as well. And then when we talk about uh, preparation programs and districts and co-design, also co-responsibility, right? I know Erica and Dr. Hernandez Scott and her team work hard to evaluate preparation programs. Think about co-responsibility and co-design is another thing that I would like to just put on the table. Um, when it comes to philanthropies, uh, Dr. Collins, I think that that's an untapped resource. I agree. I think it's also a pragmatic approach. Um, and then just remembering a little bit of our, our uh, opening address from uh, Linda Darling Hammond that uh, there is an unequal platform that education was built on. And there's an idea that we have, you know, free public schools, but the teacher is not a public good. Why is the school a public good and the teacher is not a public good? And it's in that uh, place that I think that residencies can be particularly impactful when we think not only about the, the who, but also the how that those individuals are coordinated and organized. So I'll add here to make sure that we get an opportunity to uh, discuss one or two more ideas. Um, one of the things that like so Blake I saw you just put in the chat think of what value we would have if we paired a, a, a residency program with a community school model um I wonder if we could take a few minutes to talk about um wh one of the challenges that educator preparation has is when a novice has a responsibility that is beyond their skill set and that creates um uh, less than optimal learning conditions for students. If residency programs were launched well uh, in the ways that Dr. Darling Hammond suggested, what benefits would we see for students in classrooms that are that have a resident? What might those benefits look like for residents after they graduate and now they're on their own? Would we see differences in those experiences? And will there be opportunities to to safeguard um, students from from underprepared educators who are learning to teach? Like, how do we use this well and do the least harm and the most good for the students and the students who want to learn and for the educators who are building their careers on this experience? Eric, I'm going to just jump right out here. We have a brief that I just put in the chat. Um, across our national network, uh, which is across about 14 states, dozens of different preparation program, uh, university and non-university and district partnerships, most of them have decided to adopt an instructional model, and they're using what is called a pre-service co-teaching model. So based on the special education two certified teacher co-teaching, but it's a pre-service model. They've chosen to, um, to choose that, they've chosen to use that model because the St. Cloud research on pre-service co-teaching during a student teaching year, a semester, um, showed really strong outcomes and reductions also in disciplinary pieces and student satisfaction increases in school when they had a co-teaching student teacher. And actually, if there was only a regular student teacher, um, the, the scores actually went down, both the academic scores and, and other satisfactions. So yes, the University of St. Cloud, that's, it's a really great piece. There's a lot of references in the document that I sent. 
I think what, regardless of whether it's co-teaching, being sure that it's co-constructed as an instructional model where the resident is doing the things that the resident has the capacity to do and that that is clearly articulated both with the mentor teacher and the resident over the course of the whole school year. I think that's the principle that must be grounded in order not to do any harm during the, the preparation year. Same, of course, in student teaching. You know, and I, I would just add to Karen's point, and, and, and that is that when we have other adults in a classroom, then we're, we're, we're simply breaking down student teacher ratio. And, you, and you're, you're providing those teacher candidates an opportunity to do real construct real instruction, perhaps co-constructed with the um, the master teacher. The master teacher is also learning. So, you know, they're getting the best practices coming out of the university, the best research coming out of the university. And so it becomes a symbiotic relationship and it creates an argument where a well-organized master teacher could have two different um, two or three even in, in science, math, language, we see that happening where it's really beneficial if you're very well organized as kind of a um, teaching in the round where one person takes the lead in this activity, another person takes the lead in this activity. And then we break into small groups similar to what we do in Zoom, but we do it live. And so there's there's some real possibilities there because we've break it down, broken down that student teacher ratio. And to me, that's a huge benefit. And I think um, to Karen's point about the research, we're going to see great outcomes if students have that touchstone, that conversation with one adult in their in their class. The other thing that goes with that that's different than the uh, ability to divide and conquer, which is very important, is the opportunity for two educators in front of the students to engage in metacognition to talk about how learning happens and the decisions that they've made. Because depending on the developmental level of the student, having those conversations help them to become those learners that Google say are the most important for their workforce as well. Uh, the other thing is how crucial it is that these programs be a full year so that we can address the issues such as culturally responsive practices or trauma sensitive practices or things that have emerged in the last uh, 20 years, our, our sensitivity has been heightened. Those kinds of things can't be adequately covered in a semester and certainly not in, in more shortcut approaches to the classroom. So having clinical rounds that are well-developed with the uh, host teacher also having the kind of background training and integration with the program, fully uh, a partner with the program so that they can uh, develop this range of skills uh, is, is absolutely essential for the program to have the kind of results that we want. I, um, so can I, 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 can I get in? Is yeah, right? go ahead. Yeah, I, ju I support everything that's just been said. Um, but I want to um, talk about, just mention something that I haven't heard talked about uh, in that list. Um, I, you know, I support a longer experience, ways of two teachers partnering within the classroom and so on. But um, I've come to strongly believe that there's a need for expertise that exists outside the uh, programs, typical programs and the district. And that is expertise from the communities that these programs are trying to serve. And so I, I believe that um, one of the um, things that needs to be added in to this partnering equation is opportunities for members of the communities served by the schools in which the residency program is situated to be able to not just contribute at a higher level of helping to conceptualize and develop, but also in terms of uh, sharing some of their expertise with the residents as they're learning to teach. Um, when I started out, my first job in a teacher in, the, in uh, teacher education was in the teacher corps back in the 1970s. And that was one uh, central part of the teacher core internship was um, uh, a community component in which community members participated in instruction as did uh, people from the district, teachers co-teaching or co-teaching the courses. Um, and, and so it's breaking out of this traditional mold of the university providing the coursework 
and the schools providing the clinical experience. It's it's bringing in um, community school and um, program in ways that they contribute different things because I don't believe that any one or two of those has the expertise that's needed in order to uh, address the uh, needs in the schools that residency programs have been concentrated. And so I would not leave out um, members of the broader community mentoring. Uh, just one quick example um, that I can think of of the Seattle, Seattle teacher residency, um, community partners who were involved in, in, in the program um, have been doing work at the Monroe Correctional Institute um, not far from Seattle and uh, the residents uh, pre-pandemic would go out several times a year to be mentored by the Black uh, Caucus within Monroe Correctional Facility, men who wanted to contribute to uh, talking to these teachers before they go out to try to educate them about things that they felt that um, would have helped them avoid being incarcerated down the road. And so there's many examples in, in that program of uh, community members participating in the instruction as co-teacher educators. And so it's a broader concept than is typical, uh, even in uh, many residency programs. And so I, I, I don't want to see that left out. Mm -hmm. And we have programs. Yeah. We have programs in our state who are not residency programs, but do have community-based faculty for That's that right. purpose. So I'll, I'll start with Dr. Hollins uh, and see what last comments you all have before we bring in our state panelists. Um, I, I fully agree with what has been said about um, you know, this particular issue of uh, you know this this preparation of the residents for teaching in specific context. Uh, however, um, there are some observations that I have made around these issues. Um, and one of them has to do with the actual nature of the shortage in some urban schools. And, you know, I'm thinking more immediately about what I have seen in, for example, Oakland Unified or Los Angeles Unified in terms of the actual shortages. And um, these uh, uh, Los Angeles Unified is a place where there is some involvement with teacher residencies. Um, these, these, these real shortages in urban, in the urban context don't always provide opportunities for co-teaching. You know, co-teaching is an excellent model, but these environments and the extreme shortages don't always provide that kind of an opportunity. And so, you know, in, in my thinking, if we put, if we are using um, these residencies to um, alleviate a specific shortage in situations in which another person cannot be made available to support the resident. It seems to me that we would need to be thinking about the essential tools, uh, practices, protocols, procedures, and routines that that resident would need to have walking into that situation. Um, and you know, like I'm I, I'm thinking about things like, uh, how do we help a candidate to develop um, a good instructional plan, not the lesson plan that is typically uh, required by a school or a school district, but one that would help a candidate understand, you know, like how to use a curriculum map so that you're uh, instruction is appropriately sequenced, is developmentally sequenced, uh, or how would we uh, provide the candidates with the kind of tool that would be necessary for them to develop a class profile so that they would understand who they're teaching 
and the relationship between learner characteristics and how you design uh, meaningful and productive learning experiences. I mean, what kinds of tools would we give uh, uh, teacher residents going into real high need situations that don't have the kind of resources available, partly because of the teacher shortage, but because of other reasons, they just don't have those things, but they do need to have the resident um, to support the teacher shortage. I think what I'm expressing here is kind of an observation and a concern about how we um, support candidates going into the most uh, complex situations because I see them in those situations. I'm I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Other really party. Done. <laughs> I think those are things to all those are things to, to think about. And I think that's why the like design is really important, right? Making sure that people are deeply immersed in the community. Like these are these these should not be folks who are, you know, driving in and driving out that they they are there because they want to understand and, and to be able to um, to not talk about the community as if it's something separate than oneself, right? That you emerge, you belong, um, and having that year long experience is, could uh, could support. I mean, mitigate some of that. Um, last thoughts from anyone else. Thank you, Dr. Mullins. I okay. just make one more comment about uh, mentors. We've acknowledged the value. Uh, you got to show the value. We know it's there. So if if you're going to say mentors are valuable, they got to feel valuable. They have to have time. They have to have support. They have to have connection. Uh, you can't just ask someone to do more and do more and do more. And so I wanted to, to put that in there. I think that that's well on the table here, but I wanted to underline it. The system needs to take that consideration seriously in order so that you have mentors who are truly effective and who feel like they grew in as much as the candidate grew. And then the candidate being meaningfully involved in the community life of the school, not just the community, but the school, yeah? yeah. That's such a great point, Nick. And 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 I would add as as kind of my parting comment is, I think uh, Dr. Darling Hammond kind of laid out a charge for us, and, and the fact that we cannot go back to schools the way they were pre pre pandemic, nor should we. It's time to change how schools are structured, the infrastructure, but also how we teach within those schools, and see ourselves as educated facilitators that are organized around what Ken was talking about with the community bringing in uh, what Ed was talking about with, the, with patrons and donors. It's not our responsibility. We are leading a collective that is the community. And so um, I, I, I appreciated the challenge to say, let's do things differently. And how do we allow people to do that in a safe way? And let's try some new things to take some risks. And I think that that's a really important piece at this particular historical um, inflection point. Mm -hmm. And My I'll just throw real briefly that money matters. Uh, for us to have a diverse profession, we need to have genuine routes that allow for persons that are not uh, single individuals who come from backgrounds of wealth uh, access to the profession. We have to be able to provide a living wage so that people who may have family responsibilities and come from diverse backgrounds without wealth are able to access the profession without the stress and strain of trying to work a second job. This is much too complicated a profession for people to have two jobs, two full-time jobs to do at the same time. We want them to focus and be successful. Yes, yes, yes on everything. And I just want to say there are really ways that this can happen. It takes simultaneous work. So the work of 
individual partnerships and their districts figuring out how to bring some money to bear, then work across the state of all of those stories about, yeah, we have skin in the game. We are working to make this work and it's not enough. So Erica, I saw your comment, we need more money. So then how does that come together to help the legislature understand there needs to be more money? And then all of these quality concerns, those are the kinds of wonderful professional groups you have coming together to make sure the quality pieces are part of the framework of how Washington moves forward. You guys are in a great spot. Thank you so much for your uh, knowledge and experience and wisdom. You've given us a lot to think about. There are uh, some Q&A in the chat. If you feel so compelled to respond to some of those, please do so. Uh, but now we are going to move on to our state panelists. We're probably going to go about 10 minutes past five because I want my I want my state people who are doing the work right now to have their full time. So I, I'm going to spotlight them and begin unspotlighting you all so that um, but you're welcome to stay and and continue to, uh, you know, share your ideas in the chat. I love it. Uh, respond with the audience through the Q&A. see now where are my state people at okay and here we go so we have some district leaders with us today we have some programs who are with us today and we have some pesby staff who are with us today who've actually done quite a bit of work um, in recruiting and supporting candidates of color in uh, residency programs. So I'm going to go back to my slides for just a second so I can show everyone who you are uh, broadly, and then we will get to our questions. So with us today, we have Jennifer, Jennifer DeShane Burkus from Central Washington University, her school district partner is Dina Alley from Yakima School District. Jim Meadows from the Washington Education Association with his district partner, uh, Sam Yuhan from Muggle Teo School District. Aaron Perzigian from Western Washington University and his partner from um, uh, Kent School District. And then two of my Pesby homies, uh, Michael Nguyen and K.O. Wilson, who are who have worked in the Seattle teacher residency and have brought that knowledge with them to the state. So your questions for this group, uh, what have you learned from your time recruiting teacher residents? Uh, I, we have some programs that have already recruited, some programs that are in the middle of design. So don't feel compelled to answer a question if it's if it doesn't apply to you, but here we go. What have you learned from your time recruiting teacher residents? What would you like to, what have you done to cultivate your partnerships with districts? What else would you like to see and do? Um, how my community assets show up in a teacher residency program? What might this look like in a classroom? So maybe paint a picture for us of what, what we would see if we were to step inside. Uh, what's it like to create a teacher residency from scratch? So uh, Jim from WEA, that's uh, for you. You've just launched your program. And then what's it like to transform an existing program to a residency? That's for our central and Western folks. And then the last question is, what, what, what can we expect to see from your teacher residency a year from now? So we will put those questions in the chat. Um, we could start with the first one, um, which I will toss to uh, Michael and K.O. and Jim and Sam. Uh, what have you learned from your time recruiting teacher residents? So happy to go first. Um, Michael Nguyen, Pesby Program Manager, and formerly I was a recruitment and retention manager with the Seattle Teacher Residency. 
I've learned so much recruiting residents. Um, so for all of you out there who are in university admissions, HR folks, um, I was really a believer in what you might call high touch recruitment. So I really believe in relationships first, um, spending time listening to individuals, uh, their stories, their needs, their strengths, their challenges, helping them walk through often really bureaucratic application processes. Um, I think uh, Dr. Darling Hammond mentioned how our schools are not set up for um, students of color uh, in particular and, and historically marginalized students. Um, I think many of our other institutions, including higher ed and our school districts are not set up for teachers of color in, in many much the same way. And so I think really developing that relationship really lets you see their assets in a way that, you know, like an automatic resume reader, you know, doesn't really see. Um, it gives you the advantage when you are going to things like uh, placement with a mentor teacher. Um, you know, the, the age of the students that might be working with uh, uh, might be a better fit. The types of students, what kind of context uh, might be a better fit. The geographic needs. I worked in Seattle. You know, do they have access to a car? And even thinking about little things like that, how, how do they get across a city? It sounds small, but that impacts when you're spending time sitting on three buses, it impacts the experience for somebody. Um, you know, um, language needs, what assets are they bringing, which sort of community might be a better match for them, uh, in addition to things like, you know, personality fit with their mentor teacher. Um, yeah, this takes more resources, time, FTE, took a lot of my time, but in the end, you're investing in, in the individual, they're more likely to persist in the program, uh, persist in the profession, hopefully. Uh, you're able to think about resources ahead of time to support those individuals before they even come in um, to the program um, to set them up for success. Um, so really, you got to be real with them as well. You know, uh, I think I always have that conversation with people about making sure that they know what they're getting into as well, and that many of our, some of those other institutions are not always set up to, to best fit their needs and what are, what are things that we can do. And um, it helps push us as institutions to, to shift as um, we bring in more of those folks. So long answer, but I'll pause there. Sam, KO, Jim. Uh, I'll chime in here. Sam Yuhan, uh, my title is Assistant Director of Equity and Talent Engagement in the Mukatil School District. I work in human resources. My role is really around recruitment, retention, engagement of our employees once they're employed with us. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with Jim to launch this teacher residency program here, um, partnering with WEA. What, I've learned a lot. I've had an opportunity in two different districts to be in really recruitment specific roles. And uh, what Michael said, just amen to that in terms of relationships and from the beginning, because I would say if we just rely on the old systems of uh, applicants applying and figuring out our system, we're just going to keep doing the same thing, getting the same people. Right. So we were able to reach out. And from the from the first conversations, I can't tell you like a phone call, how many phone calls and not emails that I've had and it's really funny being on Zoom all the time, but um, and not having used the phone for a few years and just making calls to every person coming into the district takes a lot of time, but you get to build those relationships, get to know what they're about, where they come from, what their needs are, and then really developing a pathway, not for being a paraeducator or a substitute para to be the end goal. Who are you? What? Where are you coming from? I will tell you, too, that a lot of, unfortunately, our global crises are leading to extremely skilled substitutes and paraeducators that come to us with foreign degrees that we could get into these programs uh, are right now in our region the the base of U ukrainian uh, refugees are just so skilled and we're getting them into roles and helping them build their english skills and utilizing the talents they that bring to us and again going to what michael said about those assets to get them into these programs um so you know we we have so many of those folks who come to us with bachelor's degrees that we get into programs. How can we lastly uh, use our, our teachers, our classroom teachers and our principals as well to that level of communication to tap those paraeducators that they see in the classroom for, for leadership or teacher leadership positions going into teacher programs that helps us. So on one end to bring people in and have those conversations, those who are already with us for our uh, teachers and principals to give us their recommendations for people uh, to enter the teaching profession. Um, and that's how we did our recruitment. And it's, it's been quite an adventure, so thanks.
Thank you for the uh, invitation to join Dr. Hernandez Scott. I'm Jim Meadows. I'm Dean of Educator Career Pathways at the Washington Education Association. Um, Sam just did an amazing job in recruitment and outreach um, in Mukilteo, and we learned a lot through him uh, that we are, are definitely sharing across our district sites. You know, one piece I want to add that was essential in our outreach was our applicants knew that they would have a salary of at least $35,000 upon applying to the program. And that really, you know, in addition to the deep authentic relationships, um, removing that financial barrier really um, for us on a very short compressed uh, recruitment timeline, we did did really well. So um, that's, it was a really important part of our first year success. Yeah, I, I go ahead and go. Um... Greetings, everyone. My name is Dr. K.L. Wilson. I'm the new PESB program manager of the Paraeducator Workforce Development Team. Prior to that, I was also the founding program director of the Academy of Rising Educators in Seattle Public Schools. We placed over 300 uh, folks of color as teacher record with over 50 being black males. So this whole narrative that there's no black males in the Puget Sound area, uh, we have a wait list <laughs> of them right now still in Seattle um, Public Schools. Um, I had the luxury of working with um, Brother Michael over here when he was at STR. And I'm just gonna double click on a lot of things that he was saying. But one thing that I think we haven't said is that love. Like I felt that how Michael recruited, as you just said, was non-transactional. It was very um, relationship-based. And it goes a long way, especially if you're, a, let's say you're a paraeducator and you've been working at a school district for over 10 years and no one has tapped on you and say, have you ever thought about becoming a teacher? If that one-on-one, -on -one, that relationship part, that building that community of care for that para, and so we have this clear pathway for you where you're guaranteed a job after completion, tuition support, no to um, you don't have to go into debt, get into the program, and you can keep your job. That's a package we can sell, folks, to where you know we're getting a more diverse um, workforce, but we're also getting candidates who actually care about the community um, that they're serving because they've been there for so long. Um, the research says that when you do support paraeducators to transition to um, certi um, certi certified roles, they tend to stay longer than someone that's not from community. And I do realize that we are in a very um, global, diverse community in the uh, Washington State area. But when we talk about grow your own, I think the residency model is a great way to um, attract folks who are from the local community. Um, and um, it's also a great way to have folks who wants to keep a salary to earn their teaching uh, credential as well. So what I learned from um, recruiting teacher residents is to really have a clear message to them in terms of like, uh, what am I getting out of this and how I'm going to support my community, but also bringing, as um, Dr. Edda said and um, Dr. Ken said earlier, that community-based um, love too, like tapping into those resources as well, because I think I've seen um, Steve Smith on the call and uh, Dr. Jim Smith. Um, they worked with me in ARE on um, the Black Educator Roundtable, the breakfast group to recruit Black males. And, you know, we don't have to do this all alone. Like, we have a tremendous support from the community to help recruit. And um, I just think that I want to end it with this. I want to turn it back over to the panel that one of my mentors once told me that communities never forget, institutions do. So we have to ensure that we're building that relationship with communities to ensure that they have our trust to do A, B, and C when it comes to um, creating a diverse teacher workforce and a quality teacher workforce as well. All right, so I'm gonna move us to our next question. What have you done so far to cultivate your partnerships? So like your, your uh, program district partnership, um, what does that look like to to say, okay, now we're partners and um, what else would you like to do and see? So let's let's start with our our district representatives and then we'll go to Jim and Jenny and Aaron. Uh, Kim, since you're up in my left corner, I'll start with you. <laughs> Well, it's great to be here. I actually, Erin, if you want to start and then I'll feed off of you. I know you have limited time, friends, so um, I'll back up after if you want to start about our relationship with Western and Kent. Uh, sure. Yeah, I'm sorry, everybody. I have to take off right at five for childcare stuff, but um, I'll jump in real quick. I think uh, 
you know, it sounds a little tongue in cheek, but the best thing Kim and I did for our working partnership is uh, trade phone numbers immediately and start texting in real time um, related to things like, uh, you know, technical things like, uh, you know, our, our MOU, right? Or more, I guess, uh, student oriented things uh, around support for individuals who need additional support and being able to reach Kim in real time when problems arise uh, or when concerns arise or however you want to frame it has has done wonders for, I think, uh, our relationship uh, with, with Kent School District. Um, and I know that's not, you know, that's not a very academic answer, just saying exchanging phone numbers, but the the human capital or the social capital that Kim has to offer and then the, the, the capital that I feel like I have to offer uh, it, it feels much more seamless over texting and over the phone than it does via email. So I think exchanging those numbers immediately and getting comfortable with kind of around the, being able to be reached around the clock um, has made Kim, you know, one of my absolute favorite people to work with. I, um, I think that that's hilarious because I think the first time this happened was over like uh, the 4th of July holiday and something happened and there we are. Like <laughs> we're on the phone, we're making this happen. And, you know, I think that, it, you know, speaking to it more broadly is that um, for these relationships to work, I, I strongly believe that a trusting partnership with clear identified roles and us being able to lean on each other for as district partners and university partners is absolutely crucial. Um, having a shared vision of just caring deeply about having the best possible teachers in front of our kids and doing everything we can to remove as many barriers as possible to make that happen. Um, it, that's how this works. It's a strong commitment to that. Um, there were so many things popping in my head as we've as we've talked and um, as the various presentations have gone on and um, one, our program in particular, um, it is a position aligned job embedded program. And so we have um, cohort members that are working as paraeducators that have a position in the district that is aligned to their program with Western Washington University. Um, they, are, they participate in a regular collaboration and co-teaching model. Um, their student teaching is embedded over two years. This is actually a bachelor's completion program. Um, and so as a result, we are able to recruit from those paraeducators that might not have ever had um, an option of being becoming a teacher or something that would be accessible to them. Um, they never knew the thought that they would be able to, you know, take off a year of work to be able to do student teaching or those types of experiences that just really are not a reality for many people in our community. Um, and through this program, um, we're able to meet that needs. They're not, they don't have to take any time off. They're having a very rich, um, experience that's all embedded within their work. And most of our um, paraeducators are also part of our community. And so that really serves us as a district as we try to develop a workforce that is um, really reflective of our community and part of our community. So sorry, long answer. So I'll jump in about Jenny and I's partnership. So Jenny and I have had a really good time because we're both very new to our roles in how we're doing this work. So Dina Alley, I am one of three HR directors for the Yakima School District, and my position is all about pathways and leadership development and district recruitment. So I, I love that. I'm a former school administrator. I've worked in a school of education before. So Jenny and I come on into our roles, and there is a little bit of work being done around this and there is a program in place that we inherit and um, it was really interesting because the model that we inherited we immediately got some feedback from candidates and teachers oh that's not really working for us so jenny and i kind of revamped how that looked um, and this year we're trying a little bit different model if you talk about like things that we talk about that we'd like to see different what I see and hear in this discussion has been almost exclusively elementary ed, which is what's easy to do. But for us, and especially when we're talking about recruiting teachers of color, is not helping us in those middle and high school content areas. And so Jenny and I constantly talk about like, 
what how can we help people who want to be secondary teachers because as budgets shift um, elementary ed is becoming a little more flooded in our region and we're still short some of those secondary people um, i'd also like to make sure that we are helping all of those people i i look at rod and his background and you know his discussion and when you think of who we don't prepare we toss poor CTE teachers into the classroom straight out of industry and say, do everything that a teacher is required to do from day one uh, while you take a few classes to like learn the school business. And so like those are things that, that we wrestle with and talk about and would like to see expanded. But and I know Jenny has thoughts, but the number one thing is like we have to be able to fund it. That's the first thing that comes out of people's mouths. I can't take a year off. Um, and, you know, to our discussion about mentor teachers is really training up mentor teachers in this model because it is different. Jenny? Yeah, I can add a little bit to what you already said, Dina. I'm sorry, also, everybody, I lost my voice. I have a coughing cold right now, so I'm, my talking is going to be limited. First of all, I'm just really excited we get to be involved at the beginning of the residency conversation here in Washington State. I just learned a ton already from the, the national folks that, that talked here, and uh, I agree with what everything that has been said. And just to add on to what Dina said, I think in our region, we're in a, a rural area. Yakima School District is actually one of the larger school districts in our central Washington region. And that's had this extra layer of challenge to it. And Dina and I have been at lots of meetings with the ESD actually thinking about, okay, like how do we do this more regionally? How do we do it for the secondary areas? Like Dina was already talking about, what does that look like? And I would say those are at pretty early stages. And somebody mentioned earlier about that shared vision. Like that's where we're at for some of these programs is what is that shared vision? Where are of supporting our community members in becoming teachers here in our region? And then how do we do that? I think that's where we're at for a lot of these things. The other thing I wanted to mention is just a quick story. Just our work this year, we had funding for some of the students and then we didn't have funding for some of the students and we were able to find a different funding source for those students. So they were able to continue in the program this year, but that is extremely important in our state right now. We don't have the same type of stable funding source in a broader context, which does mean that some people are going to be able to access this program and some are not. So that's something we've been talking about a lot between us two and just in the state in general, that's going to become really important. Jim, Sam, did you want to add any more? Yeah, I'll just um, I'll add that um, yeah, I really appreciate Dr. Zeichner's comments about the important role that unions can play with residencies. We've uh, taken that a step further in our program that is actually run by the union. We are the educator preparation program in this situation um, and working with Federal Way, Muggleteo and Walla Walla. And that's really presented some interesting opportunities for us because we already have the space of collective bargaining between our districts and local associations. So coming together to build a teacher residency was really an extension of existing relationships. What I'm really excited about going forward, um, you know, we have our first 16 residents this year, they'll graduate, you know, next August, but what would, you know, what might collective bargaining look like that creatively supports them in their first five years in the profession? So we have a retention strategy that is codified in a collective bargaining agreement that, that ensures we get um, get the retention outcomes that we want. So um, I think that's been a really unique learning for us as, as one of our assets is that shared space of collective bargaining to, um, to build out a program. Also, I wanna um, echo too. Um, now I'm just processing to me now. Um, one thing that was very unique about the ARE Academy of Rising Educators at Seattle Public Schools with the relationship with Seattle Teacher Residency too, 
is that we have a program in ARE that we help build a pool. So, I mean, I'm not trying to get math on people, but if you focus on just one population with AAs and bachelor degrees, that's going to start to diminish. So how, what are we doing to replenish the pool? So I felt this, that with the ARE model, it's a natural feeder to STR where we get these high quality candidates who already been pairs for so long. They just didn't have the eligibility requirements to partake in some of these um, residency programs. So now like people like Michael, Crystal, Dr. B and STR, they got a huge pool to choose from that are diverse, they're quality, and um, they're in their own backyard. So I also, I know the question was like, uh, what I learned from recruiting is it's good to have a diverse pool to rebuild the pool, but also it's good to have teacher professors in the um, program that look like the candidates you're recruiting too. Um, so it's, it's like go both at hand because at least for ARE, from my perspective, a lot of the brothers that I recruited like, yo, I'm not going to this school where I'm going to be the only black male and I have somebody to talk to me that like, they want to tell my story. Like, that's not what I didn't, that's not why I signed up for teaching. I want to push against that. So ARE, our ARE is unique where we have um, many folks of color. Matter of fact, at our community college, all of our staff are people of color, mostly black, where they funnel through the pathway where we give them a high quality education, a bachelor's degree, and then they get a diverse cohort with STR as well, where they get diverse um, staff as well. So we're talking about recruiting as well, but we also have to talk about like who, who's who's going to be in front of these folks? Because I'm not putting my name on just anybody going out there recruiting. I got to make sure that, you know, um, they're coming with something. So, yeah. So thank you. So for our last question, uh, this is to our, our program and district partners. Um, Jim and Sam, you all have just launched your cohort. Uh, and so I, I'm sure that was a whirlwind of experience preparing yourself and, uh, Kim and Dina and, and Jennifer, you're in the midst of planning for something to launch four years from now. Um, how can you be supported? Like, what support, so in the case of you, Jim, what support did you receive and what what supports do you wish you could still receive so that um, if you're, you know, we're building, transforming, making new changes that, um, that you're also being provided the support you need to carry this out. So could you just talk to us about like, Yes, we're doing this and we could use more help. What what might that look like? That's great, a great question. Um, you know, this really has felt like a startup for us. Like we did not have any existing educator preparation program. So not only were we building the relationships, we we're also building and implementing the residency coursework and curriculum and four clinical round rotations in special education. Um, I have to give props to Marissa Beer from Seattle Teacher Residency, who has been just a phenomenal like side by side support for our program. Um, and that's it's the longest standing residency in Washington State. It's been around around 10 years. Um, the National Center for Teacher Residencies, uh, Pathways Alliance, Karen DeMoss, um, National Education Association have all been uh, Learning Policy Institute. We're great external um, supporters. So, so we kind of, you know, we had STR here, but we had to look beyond, of course, PESB and OSPI as well, great supporters in the architecture of building out our program. Going forward, you know, I really think there's a community of practice opportunity for um, those who are already in the residency movement and those beginning to really collaborate and work together. I really, I'm excited by that. I think that has, has really uh, some really good promise for not only elevating the residency and apprenticeship movements, but also really transforming or adding to how, how uh, educator preparation programs work together and collaborate. I think we can talk about that at, at our next work group meeting, what it would look like to use some of that time as a community practice. Um, what else do you think you might need? Um, I'll, I'll oh, sorry, attended. you go ahead, Kim. Um, sorry, sorry. Um, so in Kent, we've actually been running um, 
teacher preparation programs since 2018. So we have six um, cohorts that have graduated, over 100 teachers have graduated. Um, and we and, and I'd add that the retention rate, I look at the retention rate of the entire program, and we average over 80% from the entirety of the program. So the retention rate of these programs um, is really, really high. Um, we are recipients of the Alternative Routes Block Grant for all of our partnerships. Um, that is crucial. We also, as a district, make the choice to um, turn over all of the funds that are designated for the district um, back to our cohort members for tuition assistance. Um, and also, I would add that, um, gosh, I'm trying to think how many years ago, maybe four years ago, um, we applied for additional assistance through our Title, title IIA funding um, to reimburse for this program in particular for our um, cohort members to have reimbursement of their license fees, um, their course materials. There's a few things that are allowable um, for a paraeducator or somebody that's in a teacher preparation program through Title IIA. So, the overall cost, um, if you add in then the job embedded student teaching and not having to take a leave is extremely minimal. Um, it varies in between our different programs. They currently have four programs that I work with, um, but it is um, extremely minimal. That's all I, that's all I, it's, it's really phenomenal, the opportunity and just, we just keep a constant view of trying to remove as many financial and less, like logistical barriers as we possibly can for our cohort members. One thing that I was going to add that Nina and I have been talking about, and I saw Kayla's on this too, is actually the person on the ground for most of this work is one of our attendees, but Supporting the mentor teacher, I really liked how Linda was talking about how we want our candidates, our teacher residents placed with mentors who are teaching in the way we want to see, are the models for how we want people to teach and are also good mentors and are also receiving time in the day to support our residency um, or teacher residents and having those skills and training like through the best program. So I think there's some opportunity there in that. And I know Jim, you were talking about this a little bit too on that mentor teacher side and making it the more holistic support that's for our residents is after our residents and to support our mentor teachers in that retention pieces too, because that's another area that we have an opportunity here to support retention within our school districts through these programs. So I think there's more that can be done there that we have just barely started talking about in the state. Mm -hmm. And that's something we're currently working on. Um, uh, a study because pre-service mentoring practices are, are different than induction because your pre-service mentor is evaluative. And so we're in the process of uh, conducting research, aligning to best so that we can have developmentally appropriate pre-service mentoring standards and expectations and, and looking at um, like, can this be a credential? Is there an opportunity for us to explore additional compensation um, for mentors who achieve a certain degree of competence? So we're not just randomly picking, but I was randomly picked in the hallway to be a mentor teacher. Hey, Erica, you want a teacher? And I was like, yeah, I'll take one. And I'm like, now I look back on that and I'm like, thank goodness. <laughs> thank goodness I did, I did more good than harm, but that's not always the case. So any, any parting words for the 87 attendees who are still here at five, 16. I would just say that if anybody has any questions, I would consider this community um, very collaborative um, throughout my experience of working with these programs. I and mean, we're all in it for the same thing. And so I know that I extend myself as a resource if I can help in any way. And I know that um, so many of us would feel the same. And so we have a lot of learning that we can do um, from each other. I always value these opportunities. And um, as we can lean on each other, I, I'm thankful that we can. Well, I want to thank you all for uh, being um willing to give us your time and also vulnerable in sharing 
the stories of your experience you're in the middle of doing something tremendous uh and it takes um courage to be willing to talk about something and share when perhaps it's not fully formed yet uh but this will definitely inform our thinking and how to offer supports and what we might do in partnership with the legislature uh to imagine what the policy needs to be like so that you can have the best possible chance of having a highly effective residency that um, changes lives for educators, students, and families. So with that, uh, I will adjourn us and say thank you to all who are here.